campsite set up on the riverbank. This is why we do it. This is it. Everything we do in four-wheel driving and overlanding, at the end of the day, this is the reward. And it's worth every toll, every roadblock, every flat, every, you name it. I'm Andrew St. Pierre White. Join me as I share my passion for building four wheel drive trucks and traveling to the remotest parts of the world. These videos are made possible by contributions from Patreons. Join the Patreon family now. This is one of the very best parts of my job. Few things thrill me as much as going out to take pictures or video of a magnificent place. I'm on an expedition through Zambia, accompanied by my daughter Kate. We are discovering Zambia, and while we do it, we are putting a theory to the test. That a basic 4x4 vehicle with minimal gear and almost no modifications can undertake an ambitious expedition such as this one. It's morning on day 8 and we're on the Kafui River in the Kafui National Park. Our route has taken us from the far south, far west and now in the middle of this wonderful country. Day 8 and we're on the Kafui River heading upstream into the National Park. Our Malawian driver here, Francis, very experienced on the river. Nothing like experiencing an African river from the water at first light. It is truly gorgeous, the colors, the shapes, the, it's sublime. One is perfectly safe on a boat like this, even with hippos and crocodiles around. Experienced boatsmen will never take you close to a, to a hippo unless they are showing off. And in terms of crocodiles, well, these are crocodile resistant life jackets. Uh, they work because a crocodile's very strong fashion sense just doesn't let them get close. As beautiful as the river is, there is no hiding that, like all the rivers in Zambia, its level is very low. Not only is this the dry season, but Zambia is in the grip of a long drought. We're going to be heading further east today. Our next destination is South Luangwa National Park. To get there, we must go via Zambia's capital, Lusaka. Well, we're on our way to Lusaka, leaving Roy's camp. Roy's camp, what a delight. Fantastic, by far the best campsite so far on our trip. And we're now heading to Lusaka to restock and then on to South Luangwa National Park. You get another police roadblock. Lots of them as we approach Lusaka. 
not too many generally. Um, let's see what this one's like. Standard procedure, sunglasses off, lots of friendliness. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Good, thank you. Sometimes they just wave you through, other times they look for one or more of the forms that were collected at the border post. So um, they're always close at hand in one envelope all together because oh, on average per day I would say we've been asked twice a day on average for one or other document. So as uh, the sun sets on day 8 of our Zambia expedition, we are at a place called Pioneer's Camp. It's outside Lusaka. We've uh, headed, taken from Kafui, headed east through Lusaka, got some supplies. And this is the lodge where we will actually take a break from camping. Uh, and also because we need to get up really early tomorrow to hit the Great East Road towards Pataki, Chipata and Mfui. Mfui, the gateway to the South Luangwa National Park. But we've been warned, the road is appalling. So we're going to take what is, it will take a similar time as the appalling road, but it's far more interesting, far more entertaining. It's the mountain road from Potaki directly to Mfui, and we've been told it is spectacularly beautiful. Very rough, very slow going, but really worth it. Depending on the time, tomorrow we will either wild camp on the banks of the Luangwa River or if we manage to reach Mfui we will actually find one of the local campsites. As we approach Luangwa we cross the Luangwa River. The level is depressingly low. 80% of Zambia's electricity is created by hydroelectric power. But with so little water in so many of the rivers the average Zambian citizen only gets electricity for seven hours each day. We are in, with, without doubt, the most remote, isolated, wild part of the expedition so far. We were on the main road from Lasaka to Patauk to Chipata, on our way to South Luangwa, and the road became hell on earth trucks, detours, they're building the road. And an alternative was this road and we were actually advised to take it instead. It is narrow, incredibly rough and our speed is down averaging 15, probably 15 kilometers an hour is our average speed. We've been now from Patauk when we left the road so we've done 75 kilometers and it has taken us three and a half hours so you do the maths beautiful country remote country but it, what it means is that we're not going to reach the south the gate to the south luangwa national park today no chance we are going to have to wild camp somewhere en route we're just going to push on till about five o'clock that's another hour and a half and then look for a campsite by then i'm hoping we will be we would have reached the banks of the Luangwa River. This place is teeming with game. What an amazing opportunity to wild camp here. I want to find a place off the road so that we are not easily seen by passing traffic or people. It also means there's a better chance of close encounters with animals. We are in sight of the road. Not that there's a lot of traffic, but there are, are people. So ideally, when wild camping, it'd be nice to be, be on your own and not disturbed. I'm going to have to drive the Isuzu down this bank onto, into the river there. But being in a wildlife area, we've got to take certain precautions. Wary of getting punctures by driving over logs, it's a good idea if I remove them. Travelling without another vehicle as backup if something does go wrong, so it's wise to be especially careful.
finding a wild camp uh, in a game area. The most important thing to look for are game tracks or game paths. And they're actually quite obvious, they just look like fo footpaths. They're well-worn areas where the animals move and they are often to and from water. And in this particular case, well, the one that is reasonably close is very old. You can see it's, it's been maybe months since it was last used, but still, I'm not going to park too close to it. It's a bit of a distance over there. If any animal comes down, they will be at a safe distance to be able to cross without getting worried about us, and we will be at a safe distance uh, from them, and we'll be able to watch the passing parade if we are lucky enough to have one. Uh, but other than that, just be very sensitive of the, of the ecology. Um, this is a riverbed. I felt okay driving in a riverbed. Once the sun, once the rains come, uh, any tracks that I make will be eradicated. Driving like I've done over just the ground, over in wilderness desert areas, is an absolute no-no. Those tracks never disappear. When I say never, I'm talking about 20, 30, 40 years those tracks that you've made can stay there. So it's an absolute no-no. So if you're going to drive off-road in a wildlife situation, you, you, you know, if in, in a desert environment, no. Really just don't do it. Uh, but here, of course, on a riverbed, uh, I'm not doing any harm. And this is interesting here. This is called a midden. This is where uh, it's a collective toilet, a collective wild latrine. And I can recognize here uh, Impala and this one here. And I actually can't remember what it is. Indenta indented. I don't. From my year in Botswana, I should remember what it, what it, what it is, but I, I can't. I'll have to look it up and put a title up. It was a tough day's driving. Yeah, about 10 hours. 10 hours and the last six were very tiring, very slow. Four wheel drive, second and third gear, the whole time. Anyway, we deserve this amazing campsite. Cheers. Yesterday was the, the most difficult drive um, of the trip. In fact, one of the most difficult drives I've had in, in many years. The roads were, the, the, the tar roads are typical, quite slow going, but they're build, rebuilding the main east road. And for 76 kilometers, it was bumps and detours and trucks and dust. It took us over three hours to do that 76 kilometers. We had been warned about another section that was even worse between Pataki and Chipata. And so we took the back road. Now we were told it's quite rough, but actually gonna be more pleasant and really a relief from the trucks, dust and bumps. And we did that. And it was a rough road. It was tough going. It was very, very slow, very, very rough. The vehicle took a hammering, we took a hammering, but what a reward. I mean, at the time I was thinking, oh, you know, this is really, oh, you know, and trying to make our destination. And I realized after a few hours of the rough stuff, uh, where we were going to, which is a place called Flat Dogs, near a town called Mfui, which the gateway to the, the South Luangwa National Park was out of our reach. We would get there well beyond nightfall and I'm not prepared to drive in this kind of um, country situation in nightfall. Really I avoid it like the plague. But look at the reward. What an amazing campsite. This will go down as one of the best that I've ever enjoyed. It's fantastic.
So again, the question is, why do we go to the national park and pay those very high fees when we can sit just outside the in a national park. What have we seen? We've seen <clears throat> elephant, warthog, lechwe, yeah. giraffe, all in the last hour. And we've just been sitting eating our cereal. My daughter Kate and I have just woken up in one of the most delightful campsites that I've ever stayed at. We've wild camped on a riverbed near the South Luangwa National Park on our expedition in Zambia. We've been surrounded by animals all morning. It's day 10 and we are soon to enter the National Park itself in search of even more big game. This area along the Luangwa River abutting the Luangwa National Park I'm actually not clear if you're actually allowed to wild camp here where we camped last night and but this whole area is so beautiful teeming with animals and why open I mean and I if one is allowed to wild camp here this would this is one of the most breathtaking wild camp spots left in southern Africa absolutely absolutely amazing And this tree is caked in mud. Uh, and this is from elephants. They would have rolled in the mud and then come in and scratched themselves against the tree. This is a typical elephant activity. And they have left a smooth layer of, of, uh, of mud on the tree. Look at that. Okay, here's an interesting thing. We're on our way to Flat Dogs Camp. Uh, got a car coming in the opposite direction and an elephant. Um, so this is, a, this is the busy part uh, next to the town called Mfumi, which is the gateway to the South Luangwa National Park. The actual main gate is one kilometer that way. And there are a number of lodges and camps close to the river, close to Mfui. And we're going to one of them. This is not a campsite. This is a lodge called Flat Dogs. I imagine named after wild dogs. That's my guess. But we uh, are going to be there for a couple of days. And that's where we're going to now. Perched on the banks of the Luangwa River itself is Flat Dogs Camp. Looks very nice. I was interested in these places and how they do bathrooms because that really is where they can be really creative. Now this barrier, he told us, was mainly a baboon barrier. There's the throne and an open air shower. This should be very nice. And even so we are outside of the reserve animals abound with the water level so low they can cross any animals can cross and so at this time of year they have an abundance of going inside the camp uh, they have tents they have chalets they have they cater well for self-drive travelers and uh, because self-drive travellers will, most, many of them will self-cater, so they cater for that as well. They used to be camping here, but they found it was just too dangerous because of the, the elephants and the wildlife through the camp. And even now they've said to me, you know, we've got to be very, very careful. But isn't that, isn't that beautiful? I'm looking forward to the sunset because that will make a spectacular picture. an African sunset and a storyteller. What more could we possibly ask for? So, the elephant, there's about five or eight guys. So it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, there's, oh, it's wrong to say that yes, 
that is agree, you know. So people in the village, they helping me say that, okay, no, this is my bag. Baboon, maybe my son, maybe they can dead with hunger. Say that, okay. So people in the village, they are dead. Yeah. <laughs> Early in the morning, day 11 of our expedition through Zambia. We're at Fat Dog's camp on the banks of the Luangwa River, which is fast drying out. This is the beginning of the most critical part of the drying, dry season. Rains are a good month and a half, two months away. Very little water left. And in many, many areas of the park there is absolutely no water at all. So a lot of the animals have congregated to the riverbed. We're going out this morning into the national park itself. Uh, the camps, almost all of them, certainly the affordable ones as far as I'm concerned, are outside <coughs> the national parks so one doesn't pay the, daily, the high daily fees. Uh, we will pay a fee to, to, to visit for the day. Uh, but we're going in search of some great game watching. So we're inside the park, of course, inside the park. You'll have a lot of other tourists in uh, game viewing vehicles. Um, it's, the, it, it's the way the camp is operated. They are promoting high budget tourists and don't really give too much credence to self-drive. It's considerably more, expo more expensive for a self-drive tourist to visit the park. Um, if we were on top of one of those vehicles it would cost us $40, uh, the two of us, to spend the day in the park. Uh, with our own vehicles it's $75, so it's quite a lot more, you know, so it's almost double. So they really are not too interested in the self-drive, but uh, it is accessible if you're willing to pay the price. South Luangwa National Park is the southernmost of the three national parks in the valley of the Luangwa River. It was founded as a game reserve in 1938 and became a national park in 1972. It covers a little over 9,000 square kilometers. These are African lovebirds. And this a sleeping hippo on land. Very, very dangerous is a sleeping hippo. The birds eating ticks off the impalas are red-billed oxpeckers. South Luangwa has a number of unique species. This is a Thornycroft's giraffe sometimes called a Luangwa giraffe and even Rhodesian giraffe. It is considered to be geographically isolated occurring only here in South Luangwa with an estimated 1,500 live in the wild with no captive populations. They are unique, they have very long necks, dark coloured tongues and skin coloured horns. We are very lucky to see one. Another unique species is Crawshay's zebra. But an easy way to recognize a Crawshay is that it has particularly narrow stripes compared to other forms of zebra. <coughs> it's my birthday today. <coughs> what a present, eh? A game drive like that. I can't think of a better way of spending a birthday. Back at uh, Flat Dogs Camp, waiting for our fried breakfast. We, the pampering, such as, it, as it's been, it ends today as we are heading not far from here, a place called Croc Valley. And um, we'll see what they have to offer. Uh, but what an amazing place. South Luanga really, I mean, it, this is not the best time of year to come here. And yet, this has been a highlight of my bush career. It is an amazingly beautiful place. Really, really. So we've got another couple of days here. Of all the camps <coughs> in South Luangwa, this is probably the best known. It's called Croc Valley. It's, it's famous, in a way, for overlanders and travellers. 
Um, I'm not sure why it's so well known, but I'm determined to find out. We're here for two nights, first nights in their plush, tented, air-conditioned tented accommodation. And tomorrow night we're going to slum it by camping here. Do you know what I like about Clock Valley Camp? They haven't relegated campers and self-drivers to the back end somewhere. They, I mean, they have uh, facilities for everybody. They have luxury tents, they have a place for backpackers, uh, and they even have a place for overland trucks. But campers, I mean, this is the camping area. It's right on the riverfront. We're not relegated to the bush and, and we can't see anything and they've just kind of regarded us as second-class citizens. We have the same view as everybody else. We're part of the action, we're part of the community. Well, it looks like my birthday presents haven't come to an end. Crocodile Valley Camp has uh, graciously offered us a game drive and a night drive. And we're now with a professional guide. Berta has taken us to part of the park we haven't seen. Ay, it is glorious. It is a beautiful park. Of all the African parks I've been to, this, this is right close to the top of the list. When it comes to feeding habits, these are predominantly grazers, they just feed on grass and they always be very close to water. They're very water related animals. This is where staying at a lodge where they have game drives pays off. We wouldn't have known to have come here, and it's obviously a favourite spot for evening drinks overlooking the river. So it's not just you know, buying luxury when you spend extra, you're buying experiences as well. I spent a lot of time in the African bush. I'm very privileged in that way. There are few game reserves to match South Luangwa. It is more beautiful, and I know that I'm not seeing it at its best, but even now, it is as beautiful, if not more beautiful, than maybe any other African national park I've ever been to. You have to make your way. If you're, a, if you're, if you're crazy about wild animals and wild, beautiful African nature, you've got to find your way to South Luangwa. And as it turned out, the best was yet to come. Feeding habits. They've been reclassified. They're now in the mongoose family. Okay.
Today is chill out day and we have chosen I think the perfect location in South Luanga to chill out and that being Croc Valley Camp. Croc Valley is not just a camp. I, 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 as much as I enjoyed Flat Dogs, Flat Dogs is quite stiff. Uh, what I mean by that is formal, you know it's a luxury lodge and things are done in a certain way and there's a the atmosphere there is very different from uh, Croc Valley. Here it's almost like a community and things happen here all of the time. This morning uh, there was a thing going on in the front there. They were doing preliminary training exercises with dogs, sniffer dogs, that sniff out ammunition, arms, weapons. It's an anti-poaching operation. It's also good in detecting ivories okay. and also he has been trained to detect ammunition. If someone has hidden ammunition, uh, for Ruga it's very easy to find them and also uh, firearm, a gun. Okay. He's also good in detecting where a gun has been hidden. Yeah. Also the bushmeat. They have sports events here. There's a lively pub. We had a meal last night after game drive to end all game drives. It was superb. And this to us is a, is a time, it's just past the halfway mark in our, in our expedition and we're washing some clothes and just chilling. raining yet it's not raining I can hear the rain falling on the leaves and yet it is completely dry the world's first dry rain ladies and gentlemen comes out of a sky that is absolutely completely and utterly blue I often find it quite difficult buying gifts for family when I'm on my expeditions I don't like what I like to call the airport art traditional African carvings that are sold in the curio shops and gift shops all over the place even though they might actually be made and originate from countries like Zimbabwe or Zambia or, or Botswana or whatever I like to try and find local produce local creations and I found this uh, in, at South Luanga it's a project supporting local women and children and they make these simple but rather lovely bags. Now, I don't know, but I think that is really quite charming. And it's charming because it's not same old, same old. Uh, in Livingstone, we went and shopped for uh, curios. And while a lot of the items were locally made, locally produced, they were fashioned along the demands, I think, of mass international tourism. Uh, what would be popular, you know, traditional elephant sculpture, b um, hippo sculpture and things like that, and bangles. Not too many original creative ideas. But this, I thought, was very nice indeed. We've been touring Zambia in late September. Traditionally, this part of Africa's hottest month is October. From what I can feel, October has arrived early. It's been really hot, approaching 40 degrees most days. Both Flat Dogs and Croc Valley have swimming pools. It's our last morning here. Tomorrow we're heading further east, to Malawi. In my many years of traveling. I've stayed at many lodge, many a lodge, many a campsite. And I've noticed that everyone has its own atmosphere. And that atmosphere can be 
picked up within moments of arriving. It's, 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 it's intangible. It's just something about the place that either makes you feel especially welcome or nothing. Occasionally it's really bad and you are. Uh, but I'm not talking about those ones. I'm talking about nice places that you are welcomed the instant you walk in. Before you've even seen anybody. Before you've even seen the campsite or seen the room or, or anything like that. And this place. Croc View Camp. Croc Valley Camp. Has a... It is special. There's something about it. And I noticed it the second I got out of the car. There's something about this place. And being here, I don't want to leave tomorrow. I, I don't want to leave. I could park off. I could stay here for a month. I could just... I don't know. It's that kind of place. It's very special. And of all the and I reckon that my Zambia expedition is not finished yet. I reckon this is going to be the place that I'm always going to re remember the best. Before we head to Malawi, it's time for my favorite beverage, ice cold. Cook, cook, cook. No Coke. Hello. Where's your Coca-Cola? Do you have? Yeah. Ah, okay. And glass bottles. Have them now. Thank you. Nice and cold. Now glass bottles won't survive the rough roads in Malawi, so we'll just yes, take two to say goodbye. There's something about shopping in these little little spaza shops. I absolutely love it. I just love the character. Yeah. Hey? Everyone is totally different and is in some ways the same. Um, and Coke out of glass is always better. Okay, here we go. Lake Malawi and we are three hours late. We are on day 13 of our expedition to discover the delights of Zambia and Malawi. We've been driving all day. One of the challenges of driving through Zambia is the slow progress one makes on the roads but nothing could have prepared me for how slow one travels in Malawi. We had arranged to meet the boat pickup to the island at two o'clock. It's now after five. We've travelled today from the South Luangwa National Park, across the border via Lalongwe to Salima. It should have taken three hours. It's taken eight. It's a 15 minute ride to the lodge. Our boat driver and lodge manager Chris has to negotiate the fishing lines running out from the coast. I've been travelling with my daughter Kate. By the look of it, she's feeling pretty worn out as well. Welcome to Nankomer Island, part of the Pirelli Island Archipelago. Yeah. Um, it's a protected national park from the Malawi, Lake Malawi National Park for Wildlife. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That I did not know. A UNESCO World Heritage Site. You know, when you've looked at a place on a map for years and years and years and you've, you've dreamt about going there. And to be honest with you, this was the place that I really wanted to come to, Blue Zebra Lodge. I, I really wanted to come here. And my first meeting with <clears throat> Lake Malawi was nothing what I, that, that I expected. It was actually quite horrible. I was terribly, terribly rushed. We were late. And so uh, my first impression of the lake has not been a particularly good one. Uh, anyway, so it can only get better from this point on. 
By the time we get to our chalet, it's almost dark and I'm exhausted. But still time to take a few pictures. Yeah. And I've discovered in our rush to get to the boat, I've left vital equipment behind, including dry trousers. My first impressions of Blue Zebra Lodge, outstanding. Oh, we're in Fish Eagle, that's the name of our chalet. So with damp trousers and all, we wander down for a lovely meal in the dining room. Yesterday really was a typical example of how Africa is on a different time scale than everywhere else. Um, I had planned my timings quite carefully and knew that from South Luangwa, where I had, we drove yesterday, to Lake Malawi would take a good five to six hours. Comfortable, didn't turn out like that at all. It, ended up being 11 hours and right at the end a mad rush which means today I'm at this absolutely idyllic spot uh, the Blue Zebra Lodge on Lake Malawi with uh, no clothing, no charging apparatus for our camera batteries, uh, no shoes. I We had a very pleasant dinner last night, lovely food uh, I was wearing wet trousers because I had no time to change into shorts when we got to get on board the boat. And when we, after we'd got on the boat, which actually was, had already cast off when we arrived, they actually turned back uh, to, to collect us. So it was, that's why it was such a mad rush. So uh, my first impressions of Lake Malawi were spoilt in a small, to a small degree by the mad rush that I'd found myself in. And of course this morning seeing it as in its idyllic self, that this is the, the Lake Malawi of the travel brochures, which is how I intend to enjoy it today. Taking advantage of the, uh, the other guests that are leaving, uh, the island is, uh, is an island, uh, which means that clients are ferried to and from the mainland. I'm taking advantage this morning to go and get my clothes that are left behind but even here looking into the water right there it's teeming with fish we're going snorkeling later once I've done this we're gonna go and photograph some of the fish right things I forgot short trousers charger for the camera charger for the laptop Toothpaste and toothbrush. Oh, here we go. Oh, those are my car keys. It's not commonly known that uh, hippos can't swim. Well, it's not that they can't swim, but they generally don't swim. That's why there are no hippos on the island. It's far too deep for them to cross. When hippos are like this, generally speaking, they're not swimming at all, they're standing. They're almost weightless because of their bulk and the water, so it's incredibly relaxing for them, but generally speaking, their feet are always touching the, the riverbed or the lake bed. And this is a pod of well-known hippos uh, that I imagine look at the island with envious eyes, but they can never make it there. On the return journey, we met the MV Ilala. While I try and keep the camera still, the Ilala is the second ship to bear its name, 
built in Scotland in 1949, it's had a regular but sometimes erratic service on the lake since 1951. It's the largest vessel on the lake and serves towns both on the Mozambique and Malawian sides. She carries 365 passengers, 100 tons of freight and weighs in at 620 tons. Chris also takes the opportunity to give us a better look at the Marili Island Archipelago. We'll be coming back to this part later to do some snorkeling. Right, mission accomplished, got everything back onto the island, except with a hitch. Uh, I was coming off the island and uh, the uh, returning manager wanted to say hello to me. She put out her hand and as a gentleman I put out my hand too and dropped the keys in the water. Isuzu, I really, really hope you took that into consideration when you, drew, when you designed this because if you didn't, we are in big trouble. Time now to get onto the water. Blue Zebra has loaned us two kayaks and we're off to find some fish. But not just any fish. I'm studying animal science and I'm involved in a study of the chichilids that live here in Lake Malawi and they are endemic to these three islands and we're here to find them. As it turns out, the endemic species are quite difficult to identify amongst all the other fishes. But less of a mystery is why this extraordinary place is protected. Ever since I can first remember wanting to travel, my, I, I was probably about nine or ten. My parents bought me a book, it was called Africa and it was really a coffee table picture book, all of the wonders of Africa. And I remember one particular image, and it was the image of Lake Malawi. And I also, when I was a child, used to collect stamps. And there was a Malawi stamp that had a, a, a yellow chichlid on it. And ever since then, I've had this desire to come to Lake Malawi, never got round to it, and now finally I'm here. And it is, it is a tropical island in the true sense of the word, surrounded by an enormous freshwater aquarium. The water is gin clear. Fish, there are fish everywhere. It is, a, it is beautiful, beyond compare. Really, really, I feel so lucky to be here, to be honest, really. And just to think that I'm actually here working, I suppose. These particular islands in Lake Malawi are unique because they're a UNESCO World Heritage Site, protected by United Nations World Heritage. Um, the fish which we find around these particular islands won't be found anywhere else in Lake Malawi. They are unique to this part of the lake and unique to the world. We're sitting here on a rock. I look down around me absolutely surrounded by fish. We've been taken to the other side of the island and I'm looking for that small yellow chichlid drawn on that childhood stamp. I haven't had any nibble my feet yet, but I am hopeful. There's one, there, to, to the, uh, the, the yellow one, see, no. Uh. Is that one? Ah, there's one. Freeze that frame, freeze it, go back a bit. There it is. This is a day that I will remember for a long time. Lake Malawi is, it's difficult to describe. Imagine being by the sea on a truly tropical island. I mean everything about it is quite humid, warm and there's a, there's a sea breeze and it's, this, even the smell is a little bit marine. But the water is fresh. When you go for a swim you're not sticky. You feel completely refreshed. The sand doesn't stick to your feet. So it's got all the wonderful things about the sea without the few bad things about the sea Am I talking sense? I think my impression of, of Malawi has been polished 
by Blue Zebra Lodge. I mean, it is lovely here. It is, it is a, it's a tropical paradise, if that's the cliche. I can't think of another cliche uh, more suitable than that. Um, it's well run, the, the great activities, the staff are super friendly, food is very good. But this isn't Malawi, this doesn't really represent Malawi. So what we're going to do now is we're going to drive up about two hours north of here and we're going to stay at a, a place on the, still on the lake but I want to photograph the fishermen and see a little bit more of Malawi life. Moment of truth time. Uh, we have our amazing, amazing, amazing few days at uh, Blue Zebra. Come to retrieve the car and of course it's time to find out if the keys will work. Am I stressed? Nah, of course I'm not stressed. I'm gonna take the, the Suzu if it starts to uh, down to drive down to the beach. Load it down there. Please work. <laughs> no ill effects whatsoever. Thank you for Suzu for designing a decent keyring that can withstand stupid people like me. I'm on the beach at Ningala Bay, what turned out to be a four-hour drive north of Salima. I'm having a bit of difficulty okay, in the one. thick sand. I have a feeling I'm going to struggle here. It's been a very hot day, you see, so the sand is very powdery. But what I did is um, I just took uh, about one bar out of the back tyres. So I've gone from three bar on the back down to two bar. Didn't touch the front because I could see the front tyres were proud. They were okay. It was only my back tyres that were actually digging in. So I just needed to help them along a little bit. So it was unnecessary for me to drop all four down, which saves me a lot of time pumping them up. We've got to go down to the beach later on because they launch their boats at sunset, well after sunset, uh, at the approach of dark because they use lights to do their fishing. We're staying at Ngala Beach Lodge and we're here to enjoy some of the local colour. A short walk from where we'll be staying is the village. Every day at this time it gets very busy here. <laughs> It's what you think it is. It's a Rolex Submariner date, uh, officially certified chronometer. This is what I love about travel. Uh, who doesn't love a luxury lodge? I mean, there's no reason not to. But the reason I go overlanding is because of this. And meanwhile, back at our luxury lodge, while the lodge owner fights a fire outside the kitchen, we're having dinner. I'm going to enjoy. We're not working now, we're eating. The following morning, and we've made our way down to the lake shore and walked up towards the village. The fish is called a usipa. It occurs in large shoals in open water and is attracted into the nets with the use of lights floating on the water. It 
plays a significant role in the lives of the people living along the shores of Lake Malawi. Malawi has been a revelation. Fantastic, what a wonderful country to visit. However, like Zambia, travel times are long, but in Malawi they are very long. One can very rarely get up to any speed. Trucks, pedestrians and bicycles are everywhere. Expect to cover no more than three or four hundred kilometers in a full day's driving. To end up Malawi, we're going to find some curios in the capital city of Lilongwe. How to chase people away. It's yeah. just too overwhelming. You can't actually, yeah. you know, enjoy a, a time of just looking and and sort of, you know, feeling the place and the vibe. It's just you're just totally accosted by people. This is a distinctive difference between Malawi and Zambia. We visited many towns, many markets in Zambia, and never had close to this kind of pressure or intimidation. This was just plain unpleasant. But not one to give up. We found another market. This looks a little bit uh, more suitable to tourists. I don't want to talk. I just want to look with my eyes. That's oh, all. Okay, no okay. problem. Thank you. No problem. I quite like the ones with the color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost they're more cultural. It's Sunday afternoon and they are opening the otherwise closed stalls for us. Well, not the best shopping experience, Kate did find what she yeah. was looking for. So would it be better to maybe get one like that? I like the idea of supporting local communities as opposed to craft shops. I, I just, I feel better about it, but it's also more authentic to purchase something from a place you visited as opposed to just a, a, a town. I just get more out of it personally. Uh, and now this will, to me, represent a major part of the, the Zambia expedition. And it's so handmade and it has texture and imperfections which give it character. So I don't know if I'll ever use it. I just think it's nice. And uh, Kate's going to take this. So two little, two little momen mementos as our Zambian expedition comes to a close. In the next and final episode of our expedition, we head back to Zambia and the Lower Zambezi National Park. We also discuss how this minimally equipped vehicle has handled what has turned out to be quite an ambitious expedition. <coughs> As our final evening in Zambia approaches. Time I think to reflect on what has been an extraordinary experience in an extraordinary country.
We are at Mvu Lodge, close to the Lower Zambezi National Park in Zambia, on the last day of our Zambia-Malawi expedition. It's here that we will take a break from two weeks of intensive travelling and take stock of what we have learnt from this amazing country and what the equipment we have used has taught us. Our route has taken us through Zambia, from Livingstone in the south to Lua Plains in the west to Kafui National Park in the middle South Luangwa National Park on the east, Lake Malawi, and now here down south on the Zambezi River. Local Zambian lager, and as I am not in any way a connoisseur of beer or anything like that, my review was probably meaningless. Other than to say it's actually really rather nice. It's called Mosey. But how we got to Mvu Lodge from Lake Malawi is a story worth telling. We are now at a popular watering hole in uh, Chipata. Of course Chipata is close to the Malawi border on the Zambian side uh, called Mama Rulas. Uh, it really is just a, a, a one-night stop place for travellers. And I met some interesting ones earlier on. Guy, guys with bikes, but they've got an interesting story to tell. Andrew, we are riding from Cape Town to Egypt, Cairo. It's going to take us three months. It's uh, approximately 22,000 kilometres that we're going to do. We're riding for uh, Joost van der Westeisen's uh, J9 Foundation. Uh, to create awareness and um, fundraising for motor neuron disease. So Joost was a, a, a Springbok rugby player, um, a number nine, that's where the J9 comes from, Scrum Off. And, and to um, uh, do a fundraising, they can SMS Kortpad uh, to 42305. And tomorrow we have an extremely long, arduous drive and we're hoping to get to the Lower Zambezi National Park. Well, the beauties and wonders and frustrations of travel in Africa. We, uh, we left our uh, little lodge 4 a.m. this morning because we were told that the road was very very bad lots of road works and we needed to make up time we needed to get to our next destination Mvu Lodge in good time I do not like traveling at night uh, unless it's very early in the morning when there's no traffic um, and we made very good time the road works weren't too bad and we are a good two hours ahead of schedule except for now this abnormal has lost its load in the middle of this bridge its load being a caterpillar tractor so they're working very hard, we've been here an hour already, working very hard to clear up the mess uh, and we are stuck until they do. That's Africa travel for you. Had I been traveling with uh, another vehicle, another four-wheel drive, I would have actually tried the, uh, the, the route that goes actually alongside the river and I can see tracks in the distance that actually crossed the river. If I got stuck, I would have no help. And is it worth it? I think another 30 minutes and we should be, should be out of here. As the day progresses, things are not getting any easier. The track we've chosen is a little used one through the mountains, but it is extremely rough. Okay, right, we've actually turned around. Um, not because the vehicle can't make it. Um, because it's 28 kilometers more of this that's going to take at this speed between four and five hours. And oh, this is the piece that I was worried whether the vehicle will get up. Okay, uh, I'm going to use the rear differential lock on this one. Um, because it's so remote. There are no tracks. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I mean, 
this is a really good little off-roader. I'm telling you, this is a really, really good little off-roader. I, I have nothing but praise for this little Isuzu off-road. This is not an easy track, and it's walking it. This is the this is the proper road, the alternate to the uh, extreme 4x4 track that we turned back on yesterday. It's the mountain road from the town of Kafui to Chirundu, and it's terrifying. The trucks, it is really it, this is not a road that you go fast on. But on the route is this place here, the fossil forest. We're going to have a look around. Apparently the cellulose is replaced with silica over millions of years, 150 million years ago these were, these were a, a, a conifer-like tree growing here and they've become rock. But close, so, so clearly seen is the, uh, is the texture of the wood. Oh, they're stunning. Is this one also 50? Yes. Two little, two little mementos as our Zambian expedition comes to a close. Well, again, uh, parked in an idyllic setting just outside of the National Park. This is Mvu Lodge, and the National Park we're close to is the Lower Zambezi National Park. And of course, that is the, the Zambezi River. You wouldn't think of it right now, but as we've seen from our visit to Victoria Falls, it is extremely low, although it doesn't look too low to me. We'll be spending two nights here, and uh, See if we can catch some fish. Quite a nice uh, touch at Mvu Lodge. We've been staying at the t in their nice tents, so we haven't been camping. But we haven't been eating at the restaurant because we just, you know, we spent, you know, so much time eating a restaurant food. We just wanted our own camp cooking. But they came and they, both evenings, lit a fire for us. I thought that was a really nice touch. This morning, we're going to see if Kate can catch a fighting tiger fish. It's the height of the tiger fishing season, so this should be easy. Okay, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. Okay, okay, do I reel now? Oh, I think I lost him. Yeah. I lost him. Yeah. Oh. This is a typical tiger fishing day. You'll actually land one out of ten. It's not uncommon. Did I not strike hard enough? Yeah, yeah you didn't strike hard enough and yeah. off and with tiger fish sometimes give it another strike. Yeah. You got something? No, it doesn't look like Five strikes, no fish, we'll try again later. Mvu Lodge is uh, a, a wonderful chill out spot uh, close to the Lower Zambezi National Park. Uh, and across the river, of course, is Mana Pools, which I regard as Zimbabwe's very best wilderness area. Um, but Mvu Lodge seems to be very popular because, well, it's quite busy. Uh, but it's a it's a lovely spot really really lovely spot I've spent 25 days with the Suzu double cab four-wheel drive the three-liter turbo diesel and Only can you get to really appreciate a vehicle once you've done a trip like this We've had long days on tarmac long days on rough gravel off-road, sand, rocks, and I've been carrying a load. 
That I consider to be a really worthwhile test for any 4x4. And this vehicle, I am knocked out by this vehicle. In the roughest and most difficult off-road sections, on the way down here to Mvu Lodge uh, on the Zambezi River, it performed brilliantly. It did so well. And it's a stock vehicle. It has no aftermarket suspension or shocks. Yes, it would imp that would improve things. Of course it would. A little bit of a lift would improve things. Of course it would. But as a standard vehicle, this motor is sweet. It pulls brilliantly from low RPM. It's economical. The ride is good. I have a few negative things about it. Well, actually only one. I think the turning circle is poor. Um, and honestly, it's been fantastic. So now, is it, can it be categorized with the best of the, the four-wheel drive double cab pickups? Namely, if I think about them, Amarok, Hilux, Ranger, no question about it. And if you're a serious off-roader and you want a vehicle that's going to go long, long, long distances and carry a load and, and be an instrument for fantastic overland adventures, don't ignore the Isuzu. I think up to now it's, it's, been, it's had less press than the other makes. Why? I don't know. It needs, it's, it's one of the good ones. In fact, it's one of the great ones. One of the things I set out to prove on the Sambia expedition was that it's not necessary to buy lots and lots of, of kit uh, to have an incredible time. So I've got to get some gear. I'm keeping this simple. I'm going to I'm going to carry the bare minimum. The whole this whole idea is to we don't need to buy lots and lots of kit, but we do need the minimum. We've got to be comfortable. I've carried water in water containers, one with a tap, one without, and a separate one to decant. I have strapped them down, that's all. I haven't plumbed anything, I've just kept it simple. I put load bars, ideally these load bars would actually be closer to the front of the vehicle for weight distribution. In this particular case, it's not my vehicle, I didn't want to go and drill holes anywhere to put load bars in, so I may do. But ideally, they should be up front. But apart from that, why do all the plumbing? Sticking with the theme of staying light, plastic cutlery. It's very good quality plastic cutlery, uh, really made for hikers. If you're ever thinking about what to take, if you, want, want to, you, you like this idea of being minimalistic and leaving behind the rubbish, the stuff that you don't need, and just taking what you will definitely need, speak to motorcyclists. They've been forced into every trip they do they only take what they really need. What was good, of course, is that they were close to the back, easy to access. But with a proper canopy, when I say proper, I'm talking about not a fiberglass canopy, I'm talking about a canopy that has easy access from the sides, you can put these right up front and access them from the side easily. Likewise, my boxes, packing boxes, are forward, weight forward, high up, easy to access. M my approach to Gas has changed over the years. I used to carry big gas bottles. The trouble with a big gas bottle, you have now this heavy thing that is in the vehicle. It has to be, for safety reasons, strapped down. And then when it's empty, it's still this large, heavy object. And you have to now go and find somewhere to have it filled. I now use these. They may be less efficient cost-wise, but, I mean, this trip I'm going on now Three is plenty, really. This kitchen unit, to be honest with you, nice to have. Essential? No, not at all, really. And we, we used it because it, we, we had it. Essential? Not at all. So, you've got to tie down your fridge. Do you need a fridge slider like this? No, not necessary. Again, because the canopy allows me to access from the side. This vehicle is stock apart from tires and I've changed the tires because I have my own favorites that I wanted to use. What else did I do to the vehicle? Nothing. 
but once you've got your vehicle, go on your first trip. Get some very basic kit. Go on a trip. I want to discourage you from thinking, oh, I'll go when I get this. You don't need it. Go and have an amazing time with a stock vehicle with just some basic kit in the back. Because then when you've come back from your first, second or third trip, having not spent much money, then you'll know exactly what to spend your money on and you'll get it right first time. 20 days in Zambia and um, to wrap up our expedition, I think it would be a nice idea if we talked about our favourite moments. Um, how are you? How are we going to start? Uh, well, <laughs> I actually have been writing some down, as you know. Um, best animal sighting. I think we both know what this one's going to be. Yeah, it was the it was the leopard, the kill, South Luangwa. But on the night drive. On the night But there was another one that I remember was the same time. It was the giraffe cuddling. Oh right, yeah of course that was really good too. Yeah. It was yeah. all on the same night. It was just a really successful animal sighting night. It was an amazing, amazing night drive. Just brilliant night drive. Um, okay, what um uh, what else we got? worst drive and best drive. Worst drive, what was yours? Oh gosh. Mm. Actually, coming back from Patauk, Patauk is it? Yes. Coming back, um, that wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. No, it was a long, uh, the road works, um, but before Patauk it, it was, was really bad. Yeah. But it resulted in the best camp. Oh right, the best camp, yes, which is on the list as well. Best campsite, which was the wild camp, definitely. The wild camp, we, we, the road was terrible, we were running late, it was no point in rushing and we wild camped on the Luangwa, a dry section of the Luangwa river bed. It was, oh, that was memorable. Yeah, I know, that was definitely I mean, that's, That was campsite. by far the best wild camp. Experience, yeah, definitely. What about best camp site? I, Roy's camp is up there. Roy's camp in the Kafui, very nice. What about Croc Valley? Oh, Croc Valley, yeah, I'd say Croc Valley. And the best sunset of the was, was Roy's camp. Wasn't, oh yeah, that was the best sunset, Roy's camp. But then wasn't the best sunrise, was that in Malawi or was that at Croc Valley? We ha That's right. It yeah. was Croc Valley, we had the elephants, yeah. and then Lake Malawi, we had the fishing boats. Hmm. Two astonishing sunrises. Yeah. They you, were, can't, you can't pick actually. No, you can't pick. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, Viewers can pick which one is the most <laughs> impressive image. They were, yeah. 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 What other categories? Um, we've got uh, best lodge, which I think you know what I'm gonna say. What? Blue zebra. Blue zebra on the, on Lake Malawi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Blue, you, you know. Can't, you can't beat that. Really. No, I. It is blue zebra was 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 so memorable. It really was so memorable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I should mention though, Flat Dogs at South Luanga was a very nice lodge and then we went and camped at Croc Valley and I felt that the difference between Flat Dogs, Flat Dogs is a very nice lodge but it's a business. Croc Valley is a very nice lodge and campsite but it's a love affair. Mm. This is my morning view as I woke up this morning and we're just over the halfway part of our expedition. And if you're coming to South Luanga, I give it my vote. Well, that wraps up Zambia. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about traveling to Zambia, my only advice is be prepared for an awkward border crossing. The Malawi-Zambia border crossing was easy. The Botswana-Zambia was quite tough. When you calculate your travel times, Zambia is slow. It is not as fast as Botswana or Namibia. You could probably, uh, I wouldn't say quite double, but maybe close. Malawi is very slow. On the fast sections of Malawi, you'll average 40 kilometers an hour, maybe 50 on the fast bits. 
Um, but apart from that, Zambia is fantastic. And I, I just think the people have been amazing. Uh, it's brilliant. Fantastic, brilliant country. Absolutely love it, and I shall be back. That's it from us. These videos are made possible by contributions from Patreons. Join the Patreon family now.